Hi, everybody. This is Alan Soldovsky, executive producer of the 2021 Legacy of Poetry Festival and director of creative writing at San Jose State University. I hope you all are continuing to stay safe and well at home and viewing this Zoom edition of the annual Legacy of Poetry Festival celebration. I'm here to introduce tonight's MC, Umi Ali, who will introduce tonight's poets, Ellen Bass and Toy Derricott. But before we start, let me tell you how to learn more about upcoming SJSU Legacy of Poetry Festival events. To learn more about our upcoming events, go to the URL that's shown on the screen and also that we put in the chat or follow the San Jose State Legacy of Poetry Festival on social media. Tomorrow evening, we're hosting a special tribute to the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, including a special screening of the Chris Felber documentary, Ferlinghetti, A Rebirth of Wonder. Let me begin by first thanking the sponsors who made the SJSU Legacy of Poetry Festival possible. The 2021 virtual edition of the San Jose State Legacy of Poetry Festival, Closing the Distance, Sheltering in Technologies is produced by the Poets and Writers Coalition and the Creative Writing Program at San Jose State University. We want to thank the following groups and organizations who have made these readings and special events possible. Our principal sponsor is the Poets and Writers Coalition in association with Associated Students of San Jose State who have provided us some of the funding to do these events. Additional support is provided by the SJSU English and Comparative Literature Department, the Diasporic People's Writing, Writing, Writers Collective, Read Magazine, and Poetry Center San Jose in association with Poets and Writers Inc. Our other co-sponsors for the 2021 San Jose State Legacy of Poetry Festival include City Lights Books, Copper Canyon Press, Noemi Press, University of Pittsburgh Press and Poetry Flash, the West's poetry newsletter. And a special thanks to those on the Legacy of Poetry Festival Zoom production and marketing teams who provided invaluable support and assistance behind the scenes. Clifford Gold, special events producer in the University Advancement Office. And also to our video engineer coordinators, Terry Graziani, Keith Sanders and Juan Cerna. And a special shout out to Carmen Kennedy, president of the Diasporic People's Writing, Writers Collective, who have been instrumental in making SJSU's Legacy of Poetry Festival events happen. Thank you all for giving your time and energy to make it possible for us to celebrate National Poetry Month together and close the distance during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now let me turn things over to this evening's MC, Umi Ali. Umi is a writer and poet finishing, finishing her MFA in fiction and poetry in San Jose State's MFA program in creative writing. And now here's Umi. Thank you, Alan. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, I wanted to begin by thanking the Diasporic People's Writing Collective for their relentless efforts in cultivating and connecting artists of color with mentorship, resources, and creative opportunities. So thank you so much, Carmen, especially for giving me this wonderful opportunity, but for uh, also for your commitment to furthering the scope of diverse and uh, vibrant voices at San Jose State and beyond. I'd also like to thank my friend and fellow MFA student, Rachel Crawford, who has been instrumental in helping organize tonight's event and is running the show backstage. Thanks, girl. I love you. Um, and without further ado, um, Ellen Bass and Toya Derricott. Former Poet Laureate of Santa Cruz, Ellen Bass is an award-winning poet and author of nine poetry collections, including Indigo, Like a Beggar, The Human Line, and Mules of Love. Her poems have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including The New Yorker, The Atlantic Monthly, The American Poetry Review, The Kenyan Review, and Plowshares. 
for her work, which explores the intimate and the bodily, the personal and the familial, Bass has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the California Arts Council. She is also the recipient of three Pushcart Prizes, the Lambda Literary Award and the Pablo Neruda Prize, to name a few. Her groundbreaking nonfiction book, The Courage to Heal, a guide for women survivors of child sexual abuse, has sold over a million copies and has been translated into 12 languages. Ellen is also the 2021 Lurie Distinguished Visiting Author at San Jose State University. Welcome. Toy Derricott is an award-winning poet whose work tackles the nuanced and complex issues of race, violence, motherhood, and self-identity through an autobiographical lens. She is the author of numerous po poetry collections, including The Empress of Death House, Natural Birth, Captivity, The Undertaker's Daughter, and Tender, winner of the Patterson Poetry Prize. Derricott is also the recipient of the Lucille Medwick Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America, the Distinguished Pioneering of the Arts Award from the United Black Artists, the Penn Volkler Award, two push, Pushcart Prizes, as well as fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Guggenheim Foundation, among many other honors. Derricott is co-founder of Cave Canem, an organization committed to furthering the artistic and professional opportunities for African-American poets. She is Profer Pro Professor Emerita at the University of Pittsburgh and a Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. Please join me in welcoming Ellen Bass and Toy Derricott. Well, we're happy to be here with you. Um, delighted to be here with you. And um, so happy that Toy is here in our Northern California area, even if it's just in a little screen. It's wonderful to have you here, Toy. Thank you, Ellen. It's so wonderful to be in your territory. I, I like the feel of it. Mm -hmm. You can you can tell even listening. I can tell I'm in California. That's, I, I, right. That's right. It feels it feels really nice. I don't know. We love you and uh, and we look forward to you actually being here in person when that's possible again. But for now, this is wonderful. Uh, Toy and I talked a little bit about how we'd like to do this, and I think that um, I'm going to read a couple of poems and Toy is going to read a few poems and then we're going to talk a little bit and then we're going to repeat that um, in the other order. Toy will, uh, no, it's the other way, isn't it? Toy is going to start reading. Yes. Yeah. Start reading. Okay, I've got it. I've got it now. And, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit and then we'll go in the other order and then we'll have some questions and answers. So we're really looking forward to sharing this with you. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, you know, I just wanted to, you, you and the audience to get to know me a little bit. Uh, and of course you will by my poems, but I did want to tell you uh, that I had my 80th birthday party uh, this past week. And um, it was fabulous. It was so fabulous. The organization that I, co-founded, Kavi Khanum gave me the, the party. And, uh, you know, it was Zoom, but I really felt like I was with 178 people from all over, uh, it was wonderful. So, but anyway, I wanna tell you something else that whenever I have done readings in the past, I usually feel like a, like a, a brick in me or something. I get the middle section of me gets really hard. And I decided that at this age, I need to remind myself all the time that the audience loves me. <laughs> I'm loved. You know, I mean, we need to tell ourselves that, right? How, when do you get old enough? to tell yourself you're loved. And um, the reason why I know you, you love me is because when I was a little girl and I could hardly walk, I'd pull my 
chair up to the window and climb up and I'd start waving at people out there, waving. And if somebody saw me, I'd scream, hi there, hi there. And um, I didn't realize until this year that I was looking for you guys. I was looking for poets and poetry lovers way back then. Look, really, I don't care if you love me or not, but you're my people. Sometimes your people don't love you, but you're still my people. <laughs> so that's the tone of my reading. And of course, Ellen is one of my very dearest friends and that makes it all good. So the first part of my reading, Ellen and I were talking about Audre Lorde saying, shame keeps us silent and silence keeps everything the same. And about how so much of my writing has been about confronting what I was silent about. And I guess the question we might ask is, um, does anything happen when we do that hard work? Because of course that is very hard work to confront the silence. Um, but I, I feel in a way every poem is a protest. It's a protest against silence. And um, so we can begin to ask, does anything change? Do we change by writing? Um, so I wrote about my son's birth in a home for unwed mothers. Um, he didn't know he had been born in a home for unwed mothers uh, because I dis decided to keep my, my son, most of the mothers, were very young, unmarried, and gave their babies up for adoption. And so I wrote a book when he was 17 years old, and he read the book because I wanted him to. And that's when he learned he had been born in a home for unwed mothers. And just so you'll know right from the very beginning how what a great kid he is, he came down after he read it and he said, Mom, I didn't know you suffered so much. That's what I call compassion, right? So I found this, song, this poem uh, that I wrote many years ago, and it's not in the book about his birth in a home for unwed mothers. Um, it's not in the book, but it's about that process. Hester's song. My 17 year old son asked me if I've read the Scarlet letter. I rode you piggyback through groundless sky, the stars white foam in my face. They wanted to drive you back to namelessness, were jealous of the thought of you for which the universe convulsed wide open and made a cave. I prayed you miracle to root through my fingers, grow in the spot, be with me. At night, I curled over you, guarding my rage. I thought you might escape through the crown of my head like a chimney. I lay without husband and drank at the stream of light. How wide God is, my child. Like a pillar, he wrenched me. Now you are with me like prayer. Blue clot in the night, ocean thick swimming. Hold, I say, hold. You are the one gold ever to come of alchemy.
and I'm going to take you right to the delivery section. And uh, this is a longish poem. Uh, and I'm sorry to take you right into the delivery room without any drugs or anything, but here we go. <laughs> delivery. I was in the delivery room. Put your feet up in the stirrups. I put them up, obedient, still humbled, though the spirit was growing larger in me. That black woman was in my throat, her thin song, high pitched like a lark and all the muscles were starting to constrict around her. I tried to push just a little, it didn't hurt. I tried a little more. Roll up, Guzzo said. He wanted to give me a spinal. No, I don't want a spinal. Same doctor as ax handle up my butt. Same as shaft of split wood. Dr. Spike driving the head home where my soft animal cowed and cried and prayed for his mother. Or was the baby part of this whole damn conspiracy? In on it with Gazzo, the two of them wanting to shoot the wood up me for nothing, for playing music to him in the dark, for singing to my round glass belly, for filling up with pizza on a cold night, so warm. Maybe he wanted out, was saying, Give her a needle and let me the hell out of here. Who cares what she wants? Put her to sleep. My baby pushing off with his black feet from the dark shore, heading out, not knowing which way and trusting, oarless and eyeless, so hopeless it didn't matter. No, not my baby, this loved thing in and of myself. So I balled up and let him try to stick it in. Maybe something was wrong. Roll up, he said, roll up. But I don't want it. Roll up, roll up. But it doesn't hurt. We all stood, nurses round the white light, hands hanging empty at our sides. Roll up in a ball, all of us not knowing how or if in such a world without false promises, we could say anything but yes, yes, come take it and be quick. I put my belly in my hand, gave him that thin side of my back, the bones intruding on the air, in little knobs and joints, he might crack down my spine, his knuckles wrap each twisted symmetry, put me on the rack, each nerve bright and stretched like canvas, he couldn't get it in. Three times he tried. Roll up, he cried, roll up. Three times he couldn't get it in. Dr. Y, the head obstetrician came in. What are you doing, Gazzo? I thought you wanted natural to me. Do you want a shot? No, well, put your legs up, girl, and push. And suddenly the light went out. The nurses laughed and nothing mattered in this 10 a.m sunshiny morning, we were well. The nurses and the doctors cheering, that girl combing hair, all in one direction, shining bright as water. I grew deep in me like fist, and I grew deep in me like death, and I grew deep in me like hiding in the sea, and I was over me like sun, and I was under me like sky and I could look into myself like one dark eye. I was her and she was me and we were scattered round like light nurses, doctors cheering such waves. My face contorted, never wore such masks, so rigid and so dark, so bright, uncompromising, brave, no turning back, no nose, I was so beautiful. I could look up in the light and see my hugeness, arc, electric, heavy, fleshy, living light. No wonder they praised me, a gesture one makes helpless and urgent, praising what goes on without our praise. When there was nowhere I could go, when I was so deep in myself, so large, I had to let it out, they said, drop back. I dropped back on the table, panting, 
They move the head, swivel it correctly. But I, I was losing her something ahead coming through the door. Name, please, please, name. Whose head? I don't know, some disconnection. Name, please, and I am not ready. This, the sudden visibility, his body, his curly wet hair, his arms abandoned in that air, an arching squiggling thing. His skin must be so cold, but there is nothing I can do to warm him. His body clutches in a wretched spineless way. This lump of flesh, lump of steamy viscera, who is this? child who is his father a child never having been seen before without credentials credit cards without employee reference or grades or anything to make him human make of mine but skein of pain to chop off at the navel while they could they held him down and chopped him held him up my little fish my blueness swallowed in the air, turned pink and wailed. No more, enough. I lay back speechless, looking for something to say to myself. After you had touched the brain, that squirmy lust of maggots, after you had pumped the heart, the thief, the comic, you throw her in the trash. And the little one in a case of glass, he is not I, I am not him. He is not I, the stranger. Blue air protects us from each other here is the note he brings. It says, mother, but I do not even know this man. And of course, um, that last line is from the Bible where uh, Peter denies Christ in the garden. Um, so thank you. Those are my poems, Ellen. Now let's hear from you, my beautiful. Oh, Toy, oh, Toy, my goodness. Um, I've never heard you read that poem aloud, although I've read it to myself. I just want to start talking about your poems. I know I'm supposed to read my poems next. I'm going to control myself. Um, I'm going to. I'm going to read two poems and, and then we'll talk. Um, Toy, Toy and I talk a lot. Uh, it's one of the great joys of my life that we get to talk about poems a lot and share poems. Um, and when we were talking about this reading, because uh, Toy was reading poems about birth and being a mother, I thought that I would read two poems also about birth and, and being a mother. So this poem is called Because. Because the night I gave birth, my husband went blind. Hysterical, I guess you'd call it. Because there'd been too many people and then there was no one, only this small creature her tiny cry, no bigger than a sequin. Because I'd been pushing too many hours, even with her soft skull plates shifting, the collar of my bones too slender. When I reached down, I could feel the wet wisps of hair of this being living inside me, but her heart was weakening. The midwife told me not to push on the way to the hospital. 
but I pushed anyway. This was California in the 70s, and I'd have pushed until I died. The doctor asked for permission to cut my perineum, so polite, as though he were requesting the pleasure of the next dance. Then he slid in forceps skillfully, not a scratch on her temples. But we left that haven the same night because my husband didn't believe in hospitals. The baby naked, wrapped only in a blanket because we both believed in skin to skin. Because the baby cried, but wouldn't suck. Because when I started to stand, I started to faint, so I had to crawl to the sterile diapers and pale yellow sleeper folded inside the brown paper bag I'd baked in the oven. Because I'm still there on my hands and knees, deflated belly and ripe breasts, huge dark nipples, tearing open the stapled bag, fumbling the ducky pins. Two fingers slipped between the baby's belly and the thick layers of cotton, the sharp point. The baby, a stranger, yet so strangely familiar. Flecks of blood still stuck to her scalp. Because my husband slept beside me and I let him sleep because it would be years before I left him. Now love and grief would be greater than I ever imagined, rooted together like north and south, over and under, because I too had been pushed out into another world. I lay there with the baby whimpering in my arms, both of us wide awake in the darkness. And this next poem is called Indigo. As I'm walking on West Cliff Drive, a man runs toward me, pushing one of those jogging strollers with shock absorbers so the baby can keep sleeping, which this baby is. I can just get a glimpse of its almost translucent eyelids. The father is young, a jungle of indigo and carnelian tattooed from knuckle to jaw, leafy vines and blossoms, saints and symbols. Thick wooden plugs pierce his lobes and his sunglasses testify to the radiance haloed around him. I'm so jealous, as I often am. It's a kind of obsession. I want him to have been my child's father. I want to have married a man who wanted to be in a body, who wanted to live in it so much that he marked it up like a book, underlining, highlighting, writing in the margins, I was here. Not like my dead ex-husband, who was always fighting against the flesh, who sat for hours on his Zafu chanting Om, and then went out and broke his hand punching the car. I imagine when this galloping man gets home, he's going to want to have sex with his wife, who slept in late, and then he'll eat barbecued ribs and let the baby teeth on a bone while he drinks a dark beer. I can't stop wishing my daughter had had a father like that. I can't stop wishing I'd had that life. Oh, I know, it's a miracle to have a life, any life at all. It took eight years for my parents to conceive me. First there was the war and then just waiting. And my mother's bones so narrow, she had to be slit and I airlifted. That anyone is born, each precarious success from sperm and egg to zygote, embryo, infant is a wonder. And here I am alive, almost 70 years and nothing has killed me. Not the car I totaled running a stop sign or the spirochete that screwed into my blood. Not the tree that fell in the forest exactly where I was standing. My best friend shoving me backwards so I fell on my ass as it crashed. I'm alive and I gave birth to a child. So she didn't get a father who'd sling her onto his shoulder and so much else she didn't get. I've cried most of my life over that. And now there's everything that we can't talk about. We love, but cannot take too much of each other. Yet she is the one who, 
when I asked her to kill me if I no longer had my mind. We were on our way into Ross, shopping for dresses. That's something she likes, and they all look adorable on her. She's the only one who didn't hesitate or refuse or waver or flinch. As we strode across the parking lot, she said, okay, but when's the cutoff? That's what I need to know. Toy, you're, you're muted, my darling. It's so wonderful that we're reading our poems about birth and it seems like both of us were sort of in the dark about what was going to happen to us. I mean, I had done all this reading about, you know, the Lamaze method and all of that. And it certainly wasn't the way I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I, me too. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, had, uh, I had read a book that was popular um, at the time. My daughter was born in 1978. It was popular in the 70s called Spiritual Midwifery. And, you know, birth was going to be like an orgasm. And yeah. uh, that wasn't my experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there were there was a lot that um, that mothers they there are always these expectations about motherhood that uh, I wonder if they come from men mostly. <laughs> but um, you know, how long did it take you to write about birth? That birth. It, it took me about about. 40 years. You, you, you wrote about it after 17 years. Yeah, because uh, I, I had read something, you know, because it was a secret and I, I didn't talk about it even with my best friends or my family. And uh, of course, my son didn't know. And uh, it was, it felt wrong. To, I felt in some way I was harming myself to keep this secret. Um, so what, what about you? Why did you write about it? I, I, had, I had written about it in, in journals, um, but I couldn't make a poem. I didn't know how to make a poem uh, without it sounding like my sad birth story. And um, I think it was only after I had written enough other poems and had some sense about, um, you know, some ideas about, okay, if I want to make a poem and it's about really difficult material, maybe I need a structure. And so having the structure of the anaphora of the repeated because gave me a way to write about it and focus on the, um, the craft of the poem instead of just trying to tell my story. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, when you were talking about the, the, um, the shame and, and the secrecy and the silence, you know, I wonder, I, I know that so much of your writing journey has been writing your way uh, out of that and finding also I, and in the process, also writing these poems that are so uh, dynamic, so full of power, and so moving to the to me as a as a reader. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about you know poetry and the and the unsayable and what happens when we say it. I mean, that's a big question, but I know you have a lot to say about that. I just kind of want to open the door to that. Well, you know, for me, uh, writing a poem really does change things. Uh, I mean, that's in a way how I know a poem is finished because I feel, uh, you know, Emily talks about, you know, the click of the, bo of the box, the jewelry box or whatever. And, and I really 
do experience that. I know when a poem is done. And I really feel that when I finished that book and when I finished my other books as well, I had gone through a process and um, I, did, I did feel I, I had changed in that process. Um, I know uh, that form is, is something that, you know, people are, are very interested in. And I, I wish I had an easy way to talk about form, but because uh, in school, uh, I'm, uh, when I read the classic white poets, which that, that, those are the only poets I read in, in grade school, in high school, in college, and in graduate school at NYU in 1985 we read all white male poets. <laughs> Not so much when I got in uh, to the creative writing program at NYU with Galway, but before that, uh, when, I, when I was just in the regular uh, MA program. So there was something in me that felt I was not included in what a poem should be. And so there was a part in me that was really hard and angry about that lack of invitation that I felt very, very young. And uh, I kept noting it over and over and it never got better all the way through. So was I a poet? And there was something about me just really mean in a way that didn't want to use the forms that were traditional forms. I wanted to write a different, to use a different way of forming a poem. And th these have been very difficult for me. And that's why books take so long because um, I am looking for the, po the form. I really do believe it's out there. You know, I'm sort of like, um, uh, was it Michelangelo that said, David is in the stone. All you have to do is chip away until you find David. I feel that way about poems. I feel it's, it's there. And I just have to know how to clear away whatever is obfuscating the poem. Love if that. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I certainly feel that um, I, I, I can't say every single poem I write transforms me, but the big ones do. The ones that, the ones that I feel um, the, the, the most satisfied with, the ones that, that are the hardest. Indigo definitely transform. I, 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 when I read it now, I realize that I don't feel the same way that I did before I wrote it. Yes. Um, and I, I it, it's, it, it's not that long ago that I wrote it. I, I only wrote it maybe four or five, five years ago, maybe. But writing the poem is what did it. It wasn't living the last four years that did it. It was, it really, you know, we, we talk about this all the time and, but when it happens, it still seems completely miraculous. And how did it really do that? That, that really we are writing to be transformed. That is really it. And, and yet when it happens, I go, wow, you know, it, it happened. <laughs> how did that happen? You know, it, it's something I think I almost take for granted now. I mean, I don't even think about it that much. When, when I wrote my first three books, I think, or four books, I thought about it a lot because in some ways, you know, I was writing about things that were forbidden uh, to talk about. And uh, so I had to really think about <laughs> how I was going to be changed <laughs> because a, a lot of things had to change. You know, certainly the people 
that loved me and I loved uh, changed. Um, so, but now we should hear some more poems, okay. right? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm going to write, I'm going to, I'm going to write a poem. <laughs> You're going to write one right now. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Just write it right on the spot. One that transforms all of us, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything. Um, I, I, I'm going to read um, two poems. And then um, you're gonna read again. Sound good? We, so um, one, of the, um, one of the things that I value so much in my relationship with you, Toy, is that we can talk about things that are hard to talk about, um, not only in our own lives, but also in the bigger discourse. Um, you know, as a, as a white woman, you as a black woman, um, we can, I'll, I, I'll speak just for myself. I can, I, can, I can do a misstep. I can say something stupid. I can not see something and Toy can tell me and I can thank her. And it, it, this isn't easy to find in the world. Um, the kind of trust that, that we've developed. And, uh, and it, it actually makes me teary, um, you know, saying it because it's so precious. Uh, and we were talking just recently um, about our histories and the similarities and the differences. And so I wanted to read this poem um, that is, uh, that I wrote in response to a, a project that is called New Voices, Contemporary Writers Confront Images of the Holocaust. And so I was given an image, a photograph, and asked to write a poem in response to it. And this is the poem that I wrote. And the title is the title of the photograph. Photograph, Jews probably arriving to the Woods Ghetto circa 1941 to 1942. Why is a horse here alongside the train? Two horses yoked with leather harnesses, light silvering their flanks in the midst of the Jews descending. Where is the driver taking the cart loaded with wooden planks? What is in the satchel that weighs down the arm of a woman in a dark coat, her hair parted on one side? A woman I could mistake for my mother in the family album. Only my mother was in Philadelphia selling milk and eggs and penny candy because her mother escaped the pogroms. A small girl in steerage crying for her mother. What are the tight knots of people saying to one another? A star burns the right shoulder blade of each man, each woman. Light strikes each shorn neck and caps each skull. No one is yet stripped of all but a pail or a tin to drink from and piss in. Dread like sun sears the air and breaks over the plains of their faces. Light clatters down upon them like stones, but we can't hear it. Nor can we hear blood thud under their ribs. They will be led into the ghetto and then will be led out to the camps. But for now, the eternal now, the light is silent. Silent the shadows in the folds of their coats. The bones of the horses are almost visible. Their nostrils are deep, soft shadows. And the woman who could be, but is not my mother, still carries her canvas bag and looking closer, what might be a small purse. And I, I'm gonna read one more poem. Toy and I also have talked about and written about aging a lot. Um, and uh, this poem is, um, I, I, 
Let's see, I want to say this quickly and not take up too much time. The title of the poem is Sink Your Fingers into the Darkness of My Fur. And the title is taken from a poem by um, a Finnish poet, Oli Heikonen. I'm probably saying that very badly, um, that I found on Poetry International's website. And um, I, I didn't look at the translation. I just tried to sound out the poem the way that I could without knowing any Finnish. And um, I started from what those words sounded like in English and then worked on it from there, which is a, a great experiment uh, for getting out of your own most habitual ways of writing and uh, finding, finding another entrance. Sink your fingers into the darkness of my fur. Until this sore minute, you could turn the key, pivot away. But mine is the only medicine now, wherever you go or follow. The past is so far away, but it flickers, then cleaves the night. The bones of the past splinter between our teeth. This is our life, love. Why did I think it would be anything less than too much of everything? I know you remember that cheap motel on the coast where we drank red wine, the sea flashing its gold scales as sun soaked our skin. You said, this must be what people mean when they say I could die now. Now we're so much closer to death than we were then. Who isn't crushed, stubbed out beneath a clumsy heel? Who hasn't stood at the open window, sleepless for the solace of the damp air? I had to get old to carry both buckets yoked on my shoulders, sweet and bitter waters I drink from. Let me know you, ox you. I want your scent in my hair. I want your jokes. Hang your kisses on all my branches, please. Sink your fingers into the darkness of my fur. Toy and I are just looking at each other. <laughs> I'm hoping you'll read another poem. No, no, it's your turn <laughs> now. I would argue with her, but this isn't the appropriate time for that. <laughs> I'll catch you later on this, Helen. <laughs> So I'm going to read um, a poem about my childhood, uh, and it's it's about M I N K S because in the '40s and the '50s, sometimes people actually raised minks, and you know, uh, my uncle. He worked as a postman. Most Black people who lived in the neighborhood I lived in, which was a suburban, the first Black middle-class neighborhood of Detroit, worked a couple jobs, the women too. And my uncle was a postman. And when he'd get home at three, he'd take care of the 500 minks that we had in our backyard, which was difficult work. Uh, you know, they're such beautiful animals. They're, they're so gorgeous. Uh, and I, of course, love the minks, but they're also dangerous. So when I write about my childhood, I'm always writing about race, because that's just a part of my life. And uh, I don't know if I guess it's true about white poets too. We could talk about that. The Minx. In the backyard of our house on Norwood, there were 500 steel cages lined up, each with a wooden box 
roofed with tar paper. Inside, two stories with straw for a bed. Sometimes the minks would pace back and forth wildly looking for a way out or else they'd hide in their wooden houses. Even when we put the offering of raw horse meat on their trays as if they knew they were beautiful and wanted to deprive us. In spring, the placid kits drank with glazed eyes. Sometimes the mothers would go mad and snap their necks. My uncle would lift the roof like a god who might lift our roof, look down on us and take us out to safety. Sometimes one would escape. He would go down on his hands and knees, aiming a flashlight like a bullet of light, hoping to catch the orange gold of its eyes. He wore huge boots, gloves so thick their little teeth couldn't bite through. They're wild, he'd say, never trust them. Each afternoon when I put the scoop of raw meat rich with eggs and vitamins on their trays, I'd call to each a greeting. Their small thin faces would follow as if slightly curious. In fall, they went out in a van, returning, sorted, matched, their skins hanging down on huge metal hangers pinned by their mouths. My uncle would take them out when company came and drape them over his arm, the sweetest cargo. He'd blow down the pelts softly and the hairs would part for his breath and show the shining under life, which like the shining of the soul gives us each character and beauty. And um, I'll just close with this one called Cherry Blossoms. I went down to mingle my breath with the breath of the cherry blossoms. There were photographers, mothers arranging their children against old gnarled trees. A couple hugging asks a passerby to snap them like that so that their love will always be caught between two friendships, ours and the friendship of the cherry trees. Oh, cherry, why can't my poems be as beautiful? A young woman in a fur trimmed coat sets a card table with linens, candles, a picnic basket and wine. A father tips a boy's wheelchair back so he can gaze up at a branched heaven. All around us, the blossoms flurry down, whispering, be patient, you have an ancient beauty. Be patient, you have an ancient so tender. First you devastate us and then you give us solace. 
That's what poems do, both. Mm. Maybe I'm wrong, but it looks like Robbie Nestor has a cherry tree behind her. Isn't that perfect? Yeah. Mm. So anything you we want to talk about before we ask for questions? Well, I'm I'm thinking that maybe with the timing, um, maybe we should make room for the questions. Oh, the cherries are blooming. I just saw that in the Northeast. That's exciting. Are they blooming by you, Toy? Do you have cherries? Yes. Oh, they're so beautiful. It's my favorite. Just so beautiful. But, you know, they really did talk to me that time when I wrote the poem. Oh, I believe it. Yeah, yeah. I was in, I was living in the DC area and I used to go there for the big cherry blossom festival. And uh, they're very old. Some of them are 200 years old. So. Well, then I, we're right. You do have an ancient beauty. <laughs> <laughs> they were smart cherry trees. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think they meant it just for me, Ellen. <laughs> oh, yes. They were talking to you, Toy. <laughs> you didn't even know it was in your own poem. <laughs> You see how much fun we have. <laughs> I, hate to, I hate to interrupt, especially oh, since I, I think we all can listen to you all, to you both talk to each other and read your work and just sort of bounce off of each other forever. Um, and thank you so much, both of you, for those beautiful readings and your conversations. Um, and hopefully we can, yeah, definitely. Thank you, Sally. Um, thank you so much, both of you, Toy and Ellen. Um, and before we get into some of the questions, I wanted to remind everybody to please um, put your questions into the chat and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can today. Um, I wanted to start by actually um, asking you both if you could talk a little bit about, now um, Ellen, you studied with Anne Sexton and um, a lot of your work is confessional poetry. Um, or influenced by that style. And Toy, um, your work also, again, a lot of confessional, very heavily autobiographical. And both of you um, tend to sort of dabble in the, the bodily, the corporal, and you know, that the, the internal as well, as well as the very physical and the intimate. And um, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, where both of you, who were the poets and, and the writers who influenced your work and, and particularly this brand, this style of writing that gets, you know, very raw and real and which is, uh, you know, the truth of our existence, of our being, you know, the stuff that we maybe don't talk about, but we all experience. I mean, I know I speak for so many of us who have gone through birth and labor pains and having children and and just looking at the chat alone um there's so much appreciation for you to, to lay that part of your life lay bare lay that bare to all of us and so i wanted to ask you know how where do where who influenced those those that kind of writing for you both and who were the poets and the writers that sort of spoke to your own intent to create that kind of work well, I'll go first, Ellen, here. Um, I, when I took my first poetry writing class in New York, I, I moved from Detroit uh, when I was in my late 20s and I had never really shown my poems to anyone. Uh, actually, I, uh, there was a nun that taught me in college that I showed my poems to, sister. Uh, oh God, okay. Um, but, uh, but when the first uh, class, poetry class I took, my teacher at the new school, Pearl London, read uh, Daddy by Sylvia Plath. And I know you all know that poem. And um, something in me said, whoa, you know, there's a place where Toy can put her anger. Hmm. 
you know, it, in my house, no anger from me allowed. And of course, it's bad at Catholic school. I mean, and Black people being angry, if you're middle class, that's a big no, no. Stay calm. <laughs> so when I read this poem and heard it, that was like a the, uh, the light bulb and the the sidewalk sign or the, the highway sign this way. And I was on my way. I love hearing that. Yeah. Love hearing that. Well, um, the, I guess I'll, I'll say a couple of things. One is I I um I never feel that I'm confessing anything. Um that I'm 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 using my experience uh, to investigate um, the human experience and the uh, experience of being um, you, you know alive at this time. And as I tell my students, nobody cares about you. Nobody cares what you went through. Nobody cares about your life. The, people care about what does your poem mean to them? Mm -hmm. And um, so, it, it, you know, I care of course about me and uh, I'm my first reader. I mean, I'm, I first am writing the poem for me. And, um, and it, 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 because of that thing that we're talking about that we want to be changed we want to be transformed in the process of writing it so so i don't i but i never feel like i'm i'm you know kind of telling the story of my life and um even though you do learn many things about me i mean m much much of what i write is directly from my life not everything but most of it and some of the details aren't from my life but they're good details and so I've used them but a, a lot of it is from my life and um but by going back to the kind of essence of your your very good question um when I was in college and this is in the mid-60s my very first mentor was Florence Howe. And Florence um, was the co-founder of the feminist press that um, just recently had its 50th anniversary, the longest running women's press in the world. And uh, Florence was, um, it, Florence just died in uh, September, it's great great um, loss for me. Um, we, we remained, we got very close and we remained very close. And uh, she introduced me and the other young women, we called them girls then, in our class to writers who she was excited about. And so we started reading writers like Doris Lessing, um, who I think that might have been the first time that a woman ever, in, in Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebooks, might have been the first time a woman ever got her period in literature. Um, so she, she was the person who introduced me to Denise Levertov and Muriel Rukeyser and Lucille Clifton. And, um, you know, that's kind of where, where it all began. And then, of course, Sylvia Plath and Ann Sexton, and um, and then um, you know our contem my, my contemporaries, but who were writing poems um, that were uh, incredible before I had the ability to really make my poems, um, uh, you, you know, kind of get their clothes on and get out there in the world. Um, of you know Sharon Olds writing so much about the body and 
and my more recent mentor, Dorian Lux, writing so much about the body. And, and so we, we, we're in a lineage, I think. Um, and that, that lineage is uh, continuing so that the developing poets coming up now are, are building on that too. I do want to say one thing about uh, that. I, I've been thinking a lot lately about worthiness mm -hmm. and the black body right. and how in some way my writing is to give worth to my experience to shape it into something worthy to be received. And I think, you know, uh, there's a lot about a lot of black poets today are, are writing about their experience. And I think a revisioning of the black body in this deep part of the psyche for all of us, black and white, because, you know, all the way back to slavery, the black body was only worth what it could make for another person. So what do we make of ourselves now? This is a whole different Right, and so profound, both of you. Thank you so much. And it is, so much of it is um, not, a, not just, I mean, as you said, Toy, finding worth in, in whatever you're writing and trying to find a place for yourself and a place for your community in that way. And that means so much and is so profound. And I appreciate that. I wanted to go back, take a step back a second. You had mentioned anger, Toy. And um, one of the students or somebody in our chat had put up a question that I wanted to quickly get back to before we lose the moment. Um, so Fong had um, referenced actually uh, one of your interviews in Femme Illiterate magazine regarding, uh, it was in regards to the quote, so that emphasis I had on making great poetry was almost like rebellion, a resistance. There was an anger to it even. And Fong, Fong says, um, I look at the current climate of violence in America and I see that you have all the reasons which make you angry as a poet. Can you share a bit of your process on controlling, reflecting, and understanding anger and bringing that anger or passion into your poems, not in the form of revenge? And she goes on to say, um, but in the form of contemplation, understanding, and sympathy, as you wrote in the poem, A Note on My Son's Face. Mm -hmm. That's really uh, an amazing question because it's about a whole life. You know, it, it, it's not just a, a single poem. It's, it's searching for compassion and learning. Uh, you know, when I talked about looking for poets and poetry lovers, I think that's what I was looking for, a place where we were safe to be, to bring all of our humanity and that that could be made into something that even made us think of ourselves as worthy. <laughs> you know, I mean, of course, you know, you want to be published, you want to be a great poet or whatever, but what you really want <laughs> is to think of yourself as worthy. And, uh, you know, this is the process for me. And it's a complicated thing because, you know, being a black person in a white world, and, you know, are you a light-skinned black person? Are you dark-skinned? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff to think about. You know, the way racism has sort of made the internal fights you know, the fighting you're seeing between poor white people and poor black people, like, why? <laughs> you know, um, 
it's how to work that out in, in poetry and in relationships with people like yourself who accept you as you are. This is, and Ellen and I work at this, trying to understand another human being is not an easy thing. And then you add all of this other stuff that we're taught. All I can say is to take time and to listen to yourself and to do what you need to do to survive. You know, be, be gentle and be rough. <laughs> you have to do both. So true, and especially be gentle because I feel like we're as writers, as artists, as creative people, we are so, so critical of ourselves. And yes. there's, our, there's no need for that because as you said, there's um, there are so many nuanced experiences and we are writing our own and there's going to be enough criticism out there for people who don't see your white or black or brown experience for what theirs was. And, and I feel like that's something at least I've experienced as a woman of color um, and, you know, a South Asian Muslim woman writing my experience. I often feel like, oh, one of the biggest hurdles I have to get across is, um, oh, well, my community is not going to relate to my experience. So that they're already going to start off hating me and my poetry because this is not their lived experience. And so I've already quit before I even get, you know, the poem or whatever done. So I feel like that's something that's just universal with all writers is that your nuanced, your specific experience, which what makes you unique, which makes your work necessary in, in the community, in the world, is sometimes what also makes it difficult to get people to understand and reflect and be open. But, but change happens to each of us. And if we're hoping that things will change, <laughs> then it has to start with each of us. And you have to face these hard questions about what your work means. And, you know, and it's good to have someone you trust that you can tell the truth to. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I have a few more questions from, and so some of the people who wanted to know a little bit more about um, specific craft related advice that you both may have and um, what sort of informs the writing the, the writing that you do or your writing process. Um, could you both talk a little bit about that? And, um, you know, I have specific questions. I know a couple of students wanted to know about um, repetition and how you both use that in your work or on use of anaphora. Um, but maybe to start by talking a little bit about your, your writing process and, and how you do what you do? Well, um, I would love to have a writing process, uh, <laughs> a writing process that worked. Um, because if I did, I'd just be writing so many good poems because I am, I am a worker. I am a worker bee and uh, I really know how to work. And, and if I knew how to write, uh, uh, you know, poems that, that um, th in a certain way and that that way worked for me, I would just do it night and day. Uh, I, <laughs> I'd just be publishing books, you know, right and left. And for me, every poem requires a different process. And like, for example, I told you what I did with that poem, Sink Your Fingers Into the Darkness of My Fur. Well, that was I just loved writing that poem. I just loved writing it. And I thought, oh, hell, I've got another way I can write poems. I'm going to do it again. And I didn't think like, okay, you know, be as easy, but I thought, I mean, you could do it twice, maybe not like, you know, eight times, but maybe twice. And I tried with, with about half a dozen more poems and not one of them would give it up for me, not one of them. And so it seems like every single poem I write is like I've never written a poem. I don't mean that I don't have a certain toolbox with, with 
good tools in it now, but everyone, I have to find what it wants. And it's, it's as individual as a child and I can't, so sometimes the process is super, super messy. I've been teaching this series of living room craft talks, I call them. And um, you can go to my website and find out more about it if you want to. It's just ellenbass.com. And there's scholarships and, in, and they, they really have a ton of information in them. And I, 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 there's one whole series on revision. And you know I show my revisions and other people's and, um, and, and uh, including Toy um, and, and her revisions on a gorgeous poem that she published in the New Yorker, The Great Beauty. But some of my revisions, I mean, what you see is just mess, just mess, 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 pages and pages of mess. And then it's, you know, just trying to excavate the poem from these, you know, archeological layers. And then with another poem, it might be that, um, the structure is already there in, in the very first draft. And maybe it's just a question of adding more in and um, you know, honing, honing it, honing it. Um, so, I mean, everyone is just completely its own animal and I, I wish it weren't so. But yeah, so maybe, I'll, maybe I'll just say that, although I wish it weren't so, that's honest maybe it's better that it is that way. Maybe then each poem is just itself and is not trying to be anybody else. Good answer. Um, I know I keep thinking it's gonna get easier for me. I mean, I'm 80 years old and um, I love those poems that just come to me. And, and that does happen, you know? And I sort of know when it's pretty good. Sometimes I have to ask Ellen, I'll send her a poem and ask her what she thinks. Um, I actually did some experiments where I used um, uh, uh, some, you know, traditional forms. I wrote some sonnets and I wrote some, um, uh, I've got a couple pantoons in my book. And you know, it's a, for me, it's a lot easier to use those forms <laughs> because you know, but that doesn't mean I think my poems are better that way. <laughs> I, I think that, um, that part of me that's resisting form is a good part because it makes me pay attention to what I'm doing all the time. I'm always thinking about everything. It's like balancing on, you know, a, 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 you know, out in space or something. You're thinking about every word has a has a meaning, has a place, has a sound, has uh, and how it hits the net word next to it. Lines are fascinating to me. What a line holds, why you stop a line at a certain place. There's there's something about form that's become easier for me in the past uh, few years. Well, it's about damn time. <laughs> you know, um, but uh, it doesn't mean because form is easier for me that I can write a poem easier. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know. Could you both just quickly talk a little bit about repetition and anaphora because this is so important in both of your works. I know Mario and Ale Alexandra had um, sent in questions. Mario's is more specific um, in relation to your poem in knowledge of young boys is rich. He's saying this is rich with anaphora and repetition. Did you know from the first draft of this poem that you would be implementing repetition 
how did the incorporation of repetition facilitate or influence your arrival at the stunning turn that takes place in the final tercet of the poem? Um, I did a reading at Rutgers. The, the day I wrote that, I had finished, it's the last poem in my, the book, Natural Birth. And I had done a reading at Rutgers. And there was, a, after the reading, I went to, we went to the Dean's house and we had, um, you know, I don't know, a cocktail party or something. And there was a young man there and he and I got into this fabulous conversation. And, uh, you know, I decided that, you know, he was just a great young man and I had such a good time with him. And then later on, I found out he was the Dean's son. And, um, and so I started writing this poem about him. I knew you before you had a mother. And I did not realize until I got way into the poem that it was really about something else. Wow. Wow, that's really stunning. I love, I love that way that we sometimes don't have any idea what we're doing until we've done it. And yes, you know, I, I, I don't, I wrote it so many years ago, I can't remember uh, how it took a final shape. Uh, and I, I, I probably couldn't even find it because uh, my papers are at Yale right now for all those years and I'd have to probably search in boxes for days to find it. But it seems to me that it was, it was pretty clear to me after I wrote the first draft mm -hmm. what the intention was and how to make it clear. Okay. And for both of you actually, and Ellen too, um, per Alexandra's question, when you do write a poem that is, has a lot of repetition in it, how do you then decide to break that pattern that you just spent some time creating in that poem? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, there are poems, for example, that use anaphora where the beginning of every single line has it. Uh, it, it excellent poems that do that. Um, in, in my poem that I read because, I, I, that felt like it would be overkill, um, that the, the, the poem, um, isn't really, it, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't want to just have that kind of driving force about it. Um, it, it you know, the, for one thing is, I'm sure it's a little bit hard to pick up in the first just hearing, but the poem moves around a lot in time. Um, you know, the baby's born in the beginning and then she's not born yet. Um, it, you know, it does a, a lot of moving around in time. It's not a kind of sort of, you know, regular hard hitting rhythmic poem in that way. And so the becauses were, were the engine that kept it going. Um, they were also what made me have a lot of anxiety writing the poem because, because because you know because has an answer to it it's because this then that and I mean in every poem I'm a little worried will I get to an end that that discovers something that um, opens something up but in this poem I was particularly worried as I was writing the whole first draft of it because I, I was setting myself up for a then, and I didn't know what that then was going to be. And sometimes you can kind of finesse an end somewhat, uh, but I, I, I had to come up with something. And um, so the because both, both kept, was kind of like a rope that I could kind of pull myself through the poem with, but it also was a, a great, anxiety producer. And maybe in a way that was good because 
um, although I wouldn't exactly call it anxiety, that that the the uh, destabilization or tension or whatever through the poem I was feeling as I was writing the poem, not just from remembering back, but also from the actual experience of of writing the poem. Um, it, I, I'll just add this very quickly. I wrote a poem recently um, about, uh, and the subject matter what were the wildfires in uh, where I live in Santa Cruz, uh, California um, this summer. And I, I didn't know how to write about it. And I, I um, looked at Arthur Z's poem here and I, you tried using that as a model using here and he uses here at the beginning of every line and um, it was a way that I could start to write about all the disparate things that were happening at the same time but then I took out almost all of the here's I think there's one or two here's left you'd never know that that poem started out using an aphra, but it was just a way that I could build myself. Sometimes I think of structures like that as a scaffolding, like when people are, you know, builders are building a building and they put the scaffolding outside that they can climb around on, but then they take that down after the building is built. And so in that case, I, I used it just to build the poem and then took it out. What a great analogy. Thanks for that, Ellen. Um, yeah, and so, um, oh, sorry, Tori, were you going to respond? I didn't want to cut you off. No, no, I, I'm sorry, I, I left, but uh, I'm at a different computer than I'm usually at, and it let me know my battery was getting low. It's so. okay, but we're, we're all at deep in pandemic lockdown where this is like the <laughs> pandemic bingo, right? Like how many times have you been dropped from a call? How many times <laughs> have you had the battery? This could be a good poem. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I, I, I wanted to go back to Brandon's question in the chat for both Toy and Ellen. Brandon writes, would you say that a person has to have a lot of it a lot of life experience to add a lot to their poetry. Oh, and yes. I think Alan sort of had a similar question um, or something that sort of comes from it a little bit in writing a poem, is writing a poem the result of being inspired in some way or do you look for inspiring ideas after sitting down to write? So first of all, do you need to have a lot of life experiences to add that depth or give your poetry a lot as Brandon says? You know, that's a question that you're asking because you're, you're not valuing your life enough. <laughs> you know, you, you, ha you have to really get to the self inside the life. I mean, that's what the poem is doing. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, just sitting in a chair or, you know, out in your yard or whatever you're doing, cooking some bacon. I, you know, it's, it's not how much you've done. It's, it's just searching for that way to, to, call it up and put language to it. And in a way you have to want to do it and you have to believe you can do it and you have to work at it. You know, sometimes with friends, I make a date. Ellen and I do this. We make a date and we, she's in California, I'm in Pittsburgh and we start writing around the same time and we work all day. And then at night we send each other what we wrote and we talk about it. You know, you need friends to help you know you're a poet. You, you need somebody to say, you, this is interesting. What's interesting? Oh, let's talk about what's interesting because you're learning how to edit yourself. 
but we all have life. And sometimes we just need a little help to get us to sit still and try to write it. <laughs> just write it, as so many people have said, just write it. True. Yes, when I was, when I was in ninth grade, I had a teacher who said, you've all had enough life experience to write. You know, just living through a childhood is any childhood um, is, is enough life experience to write. And um, that's almost the only thing I remember that she said. Um, and so, I think that there's no way not to have a lot of experience. I think what Toy is saying is absolutely true, that, it, that sometimes what is really hard is to um, see your experience for the, uh, the beauty, the complexity, the pain, the you know, all, all the things that are actually in it, you know, the complexity of your own experience and the specificity of your own experience. But um, it, so many poems, when you think about poems, are, are not about, you know, monumental events. Some are, but many of them are about very ordinary events that, um, where the, the writer is just able to, um, you know, like Blake said, you know, see the world in a grain of sand. You know, it's everything is, everything is interesting if you get up close enough to it. Yeah, and think of all the poems that you've let, let pass by. Um, and remember what Ruth Stone said, the poems are out there in the universe. All you have to do is put up your hand like a baseball mitt and they'll fly in. But if you don't put up your hand, <laughs> they're just gonna fly by. Thank you so much. Such beautiful, encouraging and profound words to end our wonderful event on today. Thank you so much, Ellen Bass, Toy Derricotte for joining us. I'm gonna toss this back to Alan so we can make a few final comments. Thank you so much. It was lovely meeting you both and it was lovely having you all here, audience included. Great job. Great, Great job. to be with you all. Thank you, Ume. And thank you, Ume, and thank you, Toy, and thank you, Ellen. And Ellen, you've been a, a great colleague all semester. I wish that we would uh, be able to actually be in each other's physical in-person presence, but this is a pretty good way to do it under the circumstances. So thank you everybody for joining us. You've been watching Poetry Readings by Ellen Bass and Toy Derricott as part of the SJSU Poetry, um, Poetry Festival for 2021, Legacy of Poetry Festival for 2021. The festival is presented by the Poets and Writers Coalition of San Jose State University in association with Associated Students and the SJSU Department of English and Comparative Literature and by the Poet and by Poetry Center of San Jose. Tonight's reading was also made possible by special support from the Diasporic People's Writers Collective. The week of San Jose State Legacy of Poetry Festival events are also made possible with support from Reed Magazine, the oldest continuously published college literary magazine west of the Mississippi, Poetry Center San Jose, and Poetry Flash, the literary calendar and newsletter for California on the West, in the West. Please join us again tomorrow. That's April 20th, Tuesday. Mark your calendars at 5 p.m for a special tribute to the late great poet, a saint of San Francisco and of all the world, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who we hosted a number of times on our campus at San Jose State. The event features a special screening of the documentary film, Ferlinghetti, A Rebirth of Wonder, 
with documentary filmmaker and photographer Chris Felver. We'll have a round table that will include Chris Felver, Ferlinghetti biographer Neely Cherkovsky, Poetry Flash editor-in-chief Joyce Jenkins, and San Jose State art professor emeritus Patrick Sergalski, who worked with Ferlinghetti on a number of visual art productions. Go to the URL you see on your screen that we dropped into the chat to register or to log in for tomorrow night's Lawrence Ferlinghetti tribute. You're not gonna wanna miss that. To learn more about San Jose State and San Jose State's Legacy of Poetry Festival events, click on the URL that we've now put on the screen, go.sjsu.edu backslash Legacy of Poetry 2021. This is Alan Soldowski, thanking everyone for joining us tonight and wishing you a good evening. Mm -hmm.